Oh wow. Yeah, so you know fair use, fair use at some point. It had to happen at some point. We had to start discussing this, right? So before we start this video, I would just like to point out um, some things here and just some quick reminders, right? So Deuteronomy 11:16. Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Joshua 23:6 to 7. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause any to swear by them, neither serve them nor bow yourselves unto them. The Ten Commandments Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Give thanks to the Creator. Give thanks for the breath of life. Give thanks for this moment. And welcome back. I'm glad you're here to continue the journey with me. You know, first of all, blessings, you know, blessings to Drop Nation. You know, continuing to inspire and, and learn and grow and unite. And free our minds, free ourselves. Reclaim. And it says here, Nessines, from the Latin verb Nessiere. To, know, to not know because knowledge was absent or unattainable. And then it says ignorance. From the Latin verb ignorare. To not know even though necessary information is present. Because the information has been willfully refused or disregarded. And it's very simple. Which one do you fall under? Yeah, so this is going to be a very, very interesting video. It's going to be very touchy for most of you, but it's time that we open our mind. We know we've heard this before, all the stuff I'm going to read here because this is just records I'm reading from. This is, this is information that's available to all of us. It's part of history. I'm getting this information from their sources. I'm hoping that maybe we can let our ego and personal beliefs aside just for a bit. And just open our hearts and mind to the possibility that that we may have been led away from certain truths, certain laws. We are in desperate times now. And this message is not for everybody. But a chosen few. And if you have the blessing to understand, then I'm glad you were here to watch this. So here we go. So we're going to be talking about Doth. He's going to be one of the main uh, subjects in this video. And uh, all his different forms. And where he has infiltrated. Where he has been in history. And how does he relate to the creation of Christianity. And Jesus. And also the creation of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. So who is Thoth? So let's read here on Wikipedia. Thoth from Egyptian Duuti, perhaps pronounced Dihauti, depending on the phonological interpretation of Egyptian Egyptians and emphatic consonants, was one of the uh, deities of the Egyptian pantheon. In art, he was often depicted as a man with the head of an ibis, very important, or a baboon. Animals, sacred. His counterpart was Sheshat, and his wife was Mat. Thoth's chief temple was located in the city of Qum. Qum, remember that, Qum, 
later called Hermopolis, Hermopolis, remember that, during the Greco-Roman era, in reference to him through the Greeks' interpretation that he was the same as their god, Hermes, very important, and Shimonean in the Coptic rendering, and was partially destroyed in 1826 CE. In that city, he led Agdod, pantheon of eight principal deities. He also had numerous shrines within the cities of Abydos, Hesert Urid, Perap, Repkui, Taur, Seb, Hat, Selket, Tamsids, Anchamutet, Ba, Amenheriab, and Takens. Thoth played many vital and prominent roles in Egyptian mythology, such as maintaining the universe and being one of the two deities, the other being Mat, who stood on either side of Ra's boat. In the later history of ancient Egypt, Thoth became heavily associated with the arbitration of godly disputes, okay, the arts of magic, magic, the system of writing, the development of science, and the judgment of the dead. And just we're just going to read a, a little bit more about Tav here. So it says, continuing, Tav was originally a moon god. The moon not only provides light as at night, allowing time to still be measured without the sun, but its faces and prominence gave it significant importance in early astrology and astronomy. The cycles of the moon also organized much of Egyptian societies, rituals, and events both civil and religious. Consequently, Thoth gradually became seen as a god of wisdom and magic, again magic, and the measurement and regulation of events and time. The regulation of events and time, very important right there. He was thus said to be the secretary and counselor of the sun god Ra. Okay, so he was like his second hand man, right? He's doing everything for him, his secretary, right? And with my true order, stood next to Ra on the nighty, nightly voyage across the sky. Thoth became credited by the ancient Egyptians as the inventor of writing, okay, and was also considered to have been the scribe of the underworld. And the moon became occasionally considered a separate entity, now that Thoth had less association with it and more with wisdom. For this reason, Toph was universally worshipped by ancient Egyptian scribes. Many scribes had painting or picture of Toph in their office. Likewise, one of the symbols for scribes was that of the Ibis. Now, we're going to go deep here, right? We're going to go very deep. But we're going to stay hijack free, right? And we're going to take out as many babies as we can. Right? We're going to put all this together. And we're going to just, you know, stay on that water frequency, you know. So, first, this is the uh, Emerald Tablets we're going to start talking about, right? As it says here, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, the Atlantean. And um, you can find the PDF online. You can read along if you like. I'm just going to pull out certain parts of it. I'm going to also uh, use other books as well, other sources. And we're going to link Thoth to all this. Alright, so you think this is some online fairy tale somebody just uh, uploaded and wrote? So, as it says here in Wikipedia, it says here, the Emerald Tablet, also known as the Smaragdine Tablet or Tabula Smaragdina, Smaragdina, is a compact or cryptic piece of Hermetica, right, important word right there, reputed to contain the secret of the Prima Materia and its transmutation hear this it was highly regarded by european alchemists okay as the foundation of their art and its hermetic tradition okay this word was started the whole hermetic tradition if you know what that is about the original source of the emerald tablet is unknown right they tell you tell us it's unknown but we know Toph wrote it right we're gonna show you and what he says although hermes trigemestus is the author named in the text. And again, Hermes, we read earlier about Thoth, is also known as Hermes in Greek. So it's the same person. You're going to hear that back, back and forth a lot. So don't get confused. It's first known appearance in, in a book written in Arabic between the 6th and 8th centuries. Very important again, Arabic. 
It first sources in Arabic. Why Arabic? We'll see that later. The text was first translated into Latin in the 12th century. Numerous translations, interpretations, and commentaries followed. The layers of meaning in the Emerald Tablet have been associated with the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. Philosopher's Stone, just like the Kaaba has a stone, right, in Mecca. Laboratory experimentation, phase transition, the alchemical magnus opus, the ancient classical element system, and the correspondence between ma macrocosm and microcosm. All right, so this ain't no joke, all right? Then I didn't hear, nowhere in here said this is fake. All right, so this is a considered a historical document or a tablet, whatever they want to call it, right? So uh, let's go right into the uh, Emerald Tablets of Thoth, right? The Atlantean. Again, I'm just going to pick out certain things uh, that uh, basically are going to help uh, with the topic of this video. And the tablet uh, starts out like this right away. I, Thoth. The Atlantean, master of mysteries, keeper of records, mighty king, magician, living from generation to generation, being about to pass into the halls of Amenti, set down for the guidance of those that are to come after. These records of the mighty wisdom of great Atlantis. And Toph continues, Chosen was I from the sons of men, taught by the dwellers so that his purpose might be fulfilled. The dweller. Who is that? Purpose is yet unborn in the womb of time. So he's he's saying that you know his plans is gonna go beyond you know his present time to the future or whatever time you know like it's, it's there's no boundaries like you know long ages I dwelled in the temple, learning ever and yet ever more wisdom. Until I too approached the light emitted from the great fire, light and great fire. Taught me he path to Amenti, the underworld, okay, keyword, underworld, where the great kings sit upon the throne of might, deep eye bowed in homage before the lords of life, the lords, right, of life, and the lords of death, so these lord things uh, in angelic seem to be titles, these names like God, gods, lords, you know, these are titles. Again, let's continue. Receiving as my gift the key of life. Free was I of the halls of Amenti, bound not by death to the circle of life. Far to the stars I journeyed until space and time became as naught. Gradually from the kingdoms of Atlantis passed waves of consciousness that had been one with me, only to be replaced by spawn of a lower star, a lower star. In obedience to the law, the word of the master grew into flower. Downward into the darkness turned the thoughts of the Atlanteans, until at last in the wrath arose from his Aquanti, the dweller, and says, this word has no English equivalent. It means a state of detachment. Okay, detach, detach yourself from something. From order, maybe? Quite possibly. And it continues speaking the word, calling the power. Deep in the earth's heart, the sons of Amenti heard and hearing, directing and changing of the flower of fire that burns eternally, changing and shifting, using the logos, logos, key word here, remember the word logos, until that great fire changed its direction. All right, so we're going to start talking about the sinking of Atlantis. He's going to start uh, talking about this part right now. So here it goes. Over the world then broke the great waters, drowning and sinking, changing earth's balance, until only the temple of light was left, standing on the great mountain on Undal, still rising out of the water. Some there were who were living, saved from the rush of the fountains. Called to me then the master, saying, Gather ye together, my people, take them by the arts ye have learned afar across the waters until ye reach the land of the hairy barbarians dwelling in caves of the desert follow there the plan that ye know of so they're saying go across the great waters right listen to this they're saying go where the hairy barbarians are right hairy barbarians barbaria barbaria was known as you know a lot of the parts of northern africa was called tartaria barbaria sounds very similar 
and it says dwelling in the caves of the desert there is a lot of desert that way right so let's continue uh, gathered I then my people and entered the great ship of the master upward we rose into the morning dark beneath beneath us lay the temple suddenly over it rose the waters vanished from the earth until the time appointed was the great temple so they're seeing they got on this kind of ship somehow they're looking down right I don't know if they're flying I don't know you, you tell me but they're looking down they see the temple getting covered by the waters it's gone right it's vanished from the earth all right so now they're on a ship let's continue it says fast we fled toward the sun of the morning all right what does that mean that means they went towards um, the east because that's where the sun rises right the sun of the morning right so if they're in the Atlantic like Plato said the Atlantic Ocean then they're going towards Africa or that side right until beneath us beneath until beneath us lay the land of the children of Cam all right the children of Cam or Ham Ham right Ham Cam and you saw that Tav had a temple in the city of Cum or Cam Let's continue. Raging, they came with cudgels and spears, lifted in anger, seeking to slay and utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. So they came attacking the children of Cam, like, who's this people in this ship, and who's these weird people from Atlantis, right? So they're shooting them, right? So look what Dov did to them, right? It says, Then raised I my staff and directed a ray of vibration striking them still in their tracks as fragments of stone on the mountain so he did some kind of technology some kind of weapon a vibration sounds like some sound energy right like the police used the sound thing right frequency striking them still in their tracks as fragments of stone of the mountain so they were like frozen they couldn't move then it, he says then spoke I to them in words of calm and peaceful telling them of the might of Atlantis so once he had them in a trance or you know in a vibration where they can't even move they have to pay attention or they're afraid right he spoke to them calm and peacefully like putting a spell on them right tricking them saying we were children of the sun and its messengers cowed I them by my display of magic science until at my feet they groveled when I released them so it says cowed like he you know made them become afraid like make them, made them like you know uh, vibrate low they were afraid of him and uh, because of his display of the magic science his weapon right his magic science again Thoth was known for magic science so was Hermes and we're going to continue to see that as well magic science alchemy all right and credit to Thoth and Hermes so as you can see it seems like he went over towards Egypt and took over Atlantis sank and they they went over towards Egypt and they just set up shop he set up shop now you gotta remember who Toph is I haven't gone dwelt really into it but we're gonna read further on this is falling angels right they did something bad and that's and where they were in Atlantis and it was destroyed and we're gonna read that right now with Plato Plato so how is this a fairy tale right I mean we are we historically uh, use Plato well the Greeks use Plato a lot as a philosopher and he's the f one of the first ones who mentioned Atlantis so the story of Atlantis actually well the word Atlantis comes from him and uh, all the Greeks that t have talked about it so here it goes Atlantis was a legendary island realm of the far west which was sunk beneath the ocean by the gods to punish its people for their immorality right punish the term Atlanteans was also applied by the Greeks to the Phoenician colonies along the Barbary coast of North Africa, right? Barbary coast? Didn't I just tell you Northern Africa was named Barbary? Where did they go? To the hairy barbarians, right? Duff says they went towards the hairy barbarians, Africa. Those living in the Atlas Mountains, Atlas. Diodorus Siculus describes the Titan mythology in wars with the Libyan Amazonians. Plato may have the same nation in mind for the names he Plato may have the same nation in mind for the names the second Atlantean king Gaderus after a famous Phoenician colony near the Straits of Gibraltar Plato's island of Atlantis 
from the 4th century BC it says here. Many great and wonderful deeds are recorded of your state, Athens, in our, the Egyptians' histories, right? So it's, they're saying this is his story in, for the Greeks, this is history. But one, of the the, but one of them exceeds all the rest in greatness and valor. For these histories tell of a mighty power, Atlantis, which unprovoked made an expedition against the whole of Europe and Asia, and to which your city put an end. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, okay, Atlantic Ocean. For in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Her Heracles or Hercules, right, the Strait of Gibraltar. So he's saying that in those days the, the Atlantic was navigable because during the Greeks' time they couldn't cross over. Why do you think they took so long to get to America? Why do you think the Greeks and all these people went and conquered? They couldn't get through there after it seems Atlantic sank. Remember, we're, seeing, we're, we're saying that Atlantic sank, that part at least, which was, a, it was all of America. Okay, it was just a little piece that sank. Somehow it was uh, all together. And because of what happened, it's not navigable anymore during the time of Plato and all these ancient Greeks. They can't cross over. They're telling you right here. It was navigable. That means he can't navigate in his time. Let's continue. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together and was the way to the other islands. So it was bigger than Asia, right? So it's bigger than a continent. It's bigger than Libya. They used to consider Northern Africa and most of Africa Libya. So imagine bigger than two continents, right? Because Europe was considered Asia too, so bigger than three continents. So that's, they're talking about the whole Americas. Again, I'm telling you. All right, and it was put together, it says, and it was the way to other islands, many islands, right? And from there you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent, which which surrounded the true ocean. So it says you can cross over, you know, if you cross over from, you know, Atlantis, you get to the true ocean. What is that? Are they referring to the Pacific Ocean? Okay. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Heracles, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance, but the other is a real sea. And the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. All right. Again, so Thoth left Atlantis, right? Towards the east, towards the children of Cam or Ham, right? So Cam, where is Cam? Again, Egypt, right? Let's look at right here. It says Kemenu. The ancient Egyptian name of the city means a town after the Ogdod, a group of eight deities who represented the world before creation. The name survived into Coptic as Shumonain, from which the modern name El Shumonain is derived. In Greek, the city was called Hermopolis. Again, there goes Hermopolis again. After Hermes, again, Hermes, whom the Greeks identified with Doth, okay, with Doth, because the, because the city was the main cult center of Doth. It's the main cult center of Doth, Hermopolis, remember that. The, pharaoh, the pharaonic god of magic, healing and wisdom, and the patron of scribes. Doth was associated in the same way with the Semitic Eshmun. Inscriptions at the temple called the god, the lord of Eshmun. As Toph was credited with the creation of numbers, of branches of knowledge, law, magic, philosophy, religion, science, and writing, he was thought to be an infallible judge, capable of rendering completely just decisions. The Greeks admired him so greatly that they credited him as the originator of all knowledge on earth and in the heavens. He was so important to the gods, and especially to Ra, that he was the god chosen to retrieve Ra's daughter from the distant lands she sometimes fled to. Right? So you see how he was very important in those times. Man, they're giving him credit to everything. Knowledge? All knowledge? Well, what happened to the Creator, the Most High? It sounds like this guy hijacked everything. Right? So let's continue to read. I want you to get that into your mind. Start seeing how important the, the role that, that, that Doth, Hermes, or, you know, this character had in these times, which was an important role. Toph's Egyptian name was Dijihuti, Dijuti, meaning he who is like the Ibis, right, like the bird, 
Again, the Ibis was a sacred bird in ancient Egypt as well as a popular pet and associated with wisdom. Other forms of his name are Jehuti, Tahuti, Tehuti, Sehuri, Techu, Tetu, and the lord of Kememnu, Kem, again, the later city of Hermopolis, there we go again, Hermopolis, which was his major cult center. Hermopolis was so named because of the Greek association of Doth with their god Hermes, and to the Greeks, Doth became Hermes Trigemistus, Doth, the thrice great, often given as three times great, great. He was also known as Lord of Mat, Lord of Divine Words, scribe of Mat in the company of gods, and as a just and incorruptible judge. Toph was inserted in many tales as the wise counselor and persuader, and his association with learning and measurement led him to be connected with Sheshat, Sheshat the earlier deification of wisdom, who was said to be his daughter, or variably his wife. Toph's qualities also led him being identified by the Greeks with their closest matching god Hermes, with whom Toph was eventually combined as Hermes Trismegistus, also leading to the Greek name in Toph's cult center at Hermopolis, meaning city of Hermes. It is also considered that Toph was the scribe of the gods rather than a messenger. Ampu or Hermanubis was viewed as the messenger of the gods as he traveled in and out of the underworld and presented himself to the gods and to the humans. So you see that uh, relation, that, that name, how close it is to Hermes. It's Hermanubis. So he was the messenger, he went to the underworld, just like Thoth did. So let's continue. It is more widely accepted that Thoth was a record keeper, not a divine messenger. In the Papyrus of Ani, copy of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the scribe proclaims, I am thy writing palette, O Thoth. And I have brought unto thee thine ink yar. I am not of those who work iniquity in their secret places. Let not evil happen unto me. All right, so it says chapters something here, budge of the book of the dead is by the oldest tradition said to be the work of Thoth himself. So Thoth is credited for the book of the dead, just that famous Egyptian book which we see in movies like the Mummy. All right, so there was also an Egyptian pharaoh of the 16th dynasty named. The Jehuti, Thoth, after him, who reigned for three years. So 16th dynasty, right? All right, so we know that Thoth said that he came out of Atlantis and he went over to Egypt. So Thoth is being associated with a pharaoh, right? So and so basically, um, there's a lot of uh, evidence showing, if you've seen my past videos as well and other videos from other people on YouTube, you know, the ancient world, Egypt, the Old Testament was on this side of the earth. Uh, in the Americas, and when they referred to Atlantis, they were referring to the whole continent, the whole, all the civilizations, or the empires, uh, kingdoms that were in America, okay, or ancient Egypt as well. So, when the Greeks are talking to or referring to Atlantis, they were referring to the ancient Egyptian uh, empire, which was in the Americas, and Atlantis was part of. It. Well, they were ruling, you know, these ten kings of Atlantis ruled and something happened. So they were punished and that ended. So, um, I mean, there's evidence here in the Grand Canyon, but there seems to be uh, over 2,000 archaeological sites in the Grand Canyon, uh, Egyptian or whatever other civilization they have there. Uh, Indian, seems to be a Buddha temple. Um, and only three of have been excavated. And I mean, the rest of it is sealed. The FBI has it sealed so just wanted to read this uh, to you it w I found it in the internet um, not exactly sure what book it's from but I found it very interesting so let me let me read it first real quick it says in yellow here we are not indebted to either ancient Egypt for either religion or masonry but to America it is in fact that at Memphis Egypt in the pyramids under the guidance of the kings and the mystic rites of masonry were worked many thousands of years ago but at that time, Egypt and the continent of America were one and the same. So it was the same thing. There was no distinction. So they're not saying that it was in America, but they're saying it was the same thing. So, okay, so you, you put it together. And it continues here. It says, in America, rediscovered in the 15th century and repopulated in the 17th, was recovered Egypt and the promised land or the land of the constellation of the eagle. So... This book's clearly staining. 
I wouldn't be surprised if this is uh, one of those occult mason books, because you know they hide all the secrets, and we're gonna know, we're gonna see how they got started. I mean, this is all from Thoth. This all started with Thoth. So, and one of the keywords here would be the constellation of the eagle, right? Eagle, another bird. Okay, we're gonna start seeing birds associated with Thoth, the EBs, right? Modern occultists suggest that some Hermetic te texts may be of Pharaonic origin, and that the legendary 42 essential texts that contain the core her hermetic religious beliefs and philosophy of life remain hidden in a secret library. Some trans readings of Edgar Cayce reveal that Hermes, or Thoth, was an engineer from the submerged Atlantis who also built, designed, or directed the construction of the pyramids of Egypt. Okay, so, so this is what I, uh, okay, so let's recap right so we see that modern occultists you know use this hermetic uh, teachings and we're going to learn what hermetic is uh, you know in their practices in their secret societies right so right here it's saying that um they're giving credit to Thoth for building the pyramids and we told you that um ancient egypt was in america right so we see that the jehuti started around the 16th uh, dynasty it says in wikipedia we see that there was a major hijack at that point. When Thoth set up shop in Egypt, it was in those periods from the 16th, 17th, and 18th dynasty. At that point was when the the Egypt, the modern Egypt that we know of today, in the pyramids and the big, the three big pyramids, that's when it was uh, established and built. And modern scholars will tell you they don't know how Samaria and Egypt and all these civilizations started out of nothing. There's no like written record of, of the track of how it, they just all of a sudden knew how to write, how to build, had math, had everything, all of a sudden. And we know now why, because we know that Thoth and the Atlanteans set up shop with the sons of Cam, right? The sons of Ham, the children of Cam and Cam in Egypt. And so he taught them all these things. That's why they're giving him credit, as we read before, uh, for creating all of knowledge. Because he came and taught them all these arts that they didn't know, all these sciences that they didn't know. Alright, this fallen angel teachings uh, from Atlantis. Alright, so let's continue, okay? So another uh, recurring theme with uh, Thoth uh, would be alchemy, right? So let's read a little bit about alchemy, right? It says, in about 300 AD, Sosimos provided one of the first definitions of alchemy as the study of the composition of waters, movement, growth, and embodying and disembodying drawing the spirits from bodies and bonding the spirits within bodies. In general, Sosimos' understanding of alchemy reflects the influence of hermetic and Gnostic spiritualities. He asserted that the falling angels taught the arts of me metallurgy to the women they married, an idea also rec recorded in the book of Enoch and later repeated in the Gnostic uh, Apocryphon of John. In a fragment preserved by Sincelus, Sosimos wrote, the ancient and divine writings say that the angels became in enamored of women and descending taught them all the works of nature. From them, therefore, is the first tradition, Shema, concerning these arts. For they called this book Shema, and hence the science of chemistry takes its name. Alright, so look, falling angels, right? Who am I telling you Thoth is, right? And all these uh, gods from the past, these falling angels, right? Genesis 6 tells us that you know the sons of God came down to the uh, daughters of men and out of them came the Nephilim right the giants so how far is this story how far-fetched is all this story all right let's continue etymology of uh, chemistry right or chema or chema as I was saying it before I'm saying it wrong but it was chema right so here we go the word alchemy was borrowed from old French alchemia alchemy taken from medieval latin alchemia and which is in turn borrowed from arabic alchemia the arabic word is borrowed from late greek keme kemeia kemia with the agglutination agglutination of the arabic definite article this ancient greek word was derived from the early greek name for egypt okay kemia based on the egyptian name for egypt kem black earth as opposed to the red desert sand 
So the medieval Latin form was influenced by Greek chimeia, meaning mixture, and referring to pharmaceutical chemistry. So Thoth wrote in the Emerald Tablets that he went to the sons of Cam, right? So Cam means Egypt, and that's where you get chemistry or alchemy. Okay, let's keep going. The central figure in mythology of alchemy is Hermes Trismegistus, or Tris Great Hermes. His name is derived from the god Thoth and his Greek counterpart Hermes. So these three people are the same entity, same person. Hermes and his caduceus, or serpent staff, were among alchemy's principal symbols. According to Clement of Alexandria, he wrote that he wrote what were called the 42 books of Hermes, covering all fields of knowledge. The Hermetica of Trice Great Hermes is generally understood to form the basis for Western alchemical philosophy and practice, called the Hermetic philosophy, by its early practitioners. These writings were collected in the first centuries of the Common Era. So, Toph is Hermes, right? So, let's read about Hermes. Hermes is an Olympian god in Greek religion and mythology, the son of Zeus, and the Pleiad Maya, and the second youngest of the Olympian gods, Dionysus being the youngest. Hermes was the emissary and messenger of the gods. So, just like Thoth was uh, secretary to Ra, if we remember, right? Thoth was secretary to Ra. He was like mediator between the two worlds. So we're gonna we're reading right now that. Hermes as well is an emissary and messenger of the god. It says here Hermes was also the divine trickster, a divine trickster. We're gonna start seeing that word related to Thoth and Hermes as well. Trickster, right? Alright. And the god of boundaries and transgression of boundaries. So somebody who didn't follow rules or or, or order. Transgression of boundaries. Alright, Hermes is Thoth, so it's the same person. The patron of herdsmen, thieves, graves, and heralds. He is described as moving freely between the worlds of the mortal and divine and was the conductor of souls in the afterlife, just like Thoth. He was also viewed as the protector and patron of roads and travelers. Continuing with Hermes, it says the epithets of Hermes. Right here it says the Atlantiades. Hermes was also called Atlantiades because of his mother Maya was the daughter of Atlas. Alright, so who was also from Atlantis? Thoth, right? He said it himself, he came from Atlantis in the Emerald Tablets, right? You see another correlation here. And it says, Kriophoros, Kriosphoros, Christ, Kriosphoros, Kriophoros, an ancient Greek cult, Kriophoros, or Kriophoros, the ram bearer, is a figure that com commemorates the solemn sacrifice of a ram. It becomes an epithet of Hermes, Hermes Kriophoros. So another interpretation or another depiction of Hermes aka Thoth all right remember this Creo photos we're gonna see how important this is later and it says the Argi Fontes Hermes epithet meaning Argus slayer recalls his slaying of the hundred-eyed giant Argus Panoptes it says and who was watching over the hyphen nymph lo in the sanctuary of Queen Hera herself in Argus Hermes placed a charm of Argus eyes with the caduceus to cause the giant to sleep after this, he slew the giant. Argo's eyes were then put into the tail of the peacock. Okay, peacock, a symbol of the goddess Hera. So peacock, we start hearing about the peacock and another bird, right? And it continues, messenger and guide. And it says here, the chief office of the god was as messenger. So the chief office of the god was as messenger. Hermes. The messenger is in fact only seen in this role for Zeus from within the pages of the Odyssey. Continuing with Hermes, in some myths he is a trickster, once again, and outwits other gods for his own satisfaction or for the sake of humankind. humankind. So he outwits other gods for his satisfaction. So he even transgresses against other gods or, or other fallen angels, right? His attributes and symbols include the herma, the rooster, again another bird right there, the tortoise, satchel or pouch, winged sandals, and winged cap. His main symbol is the Greek uh, kerikeion, or Latin caduceus, which appears in a form of two snakes wrapped around a winged staff with carvings of other gods. In the Roman adaptation of the Greek pantheon, Hermes is identified with the Roman god Mercury. Alright, so you see, Hermes 
is Mercury, aka Thoth, right? So there, you you start seeing that Thoth is playing important roles everywhere in all these civilizations. They're just changing his name. Who, though, inherited from the Etruscans, developed many similar characteristics, such as being a patron of commerce. Okay, so we got this other character, right? Hermes Trismegistus, or Gistus, but we're going in circles here. You, we know it's the same character, it's the same person. So it says here, is purported author of the Hermetic Corpus, a series of sacred texts that are basis of Hermetism. And it says the name means thrice greatest Hermes, or three times great. Origin and identity, it says here about Hermes Trim Trimegistus, may be a representation of the syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and Egyptian god Thoth. Greek and Hellenistic Egypt recognized the equivalence of Hermes and Thoth. Consequently, the two gods were worshipped as one in what had been the Temple of Thoth and Chemnu, the Temple of Thoth and Chemnu, which the Greeks called Hermopolis. It says here, the Hermetic literature among the Egyptians, which was concerned with conjuring spirits and animating statues, informed the oldest Hellenistic writings on Greco-Babylonian astrology, and on the newly developed practice of alchemy. In parallel tra tradition, hermetic philosophy rationalized and systematized religious cult practices and offered an adept a means of personal ascension from constraints of physical being. This later tradition has led to the confusion of hermetism with Gnosticism, which was developing contemporaneously. As a divine source of wisdom, Hermes Trigamestus was credited with tens of thousands of highly esteemed writings, which were reputed to be of immense antiquity. Plato's Timius and Critias state that in the temple of Naif and Sais, there were secret halls containing historical records which had been kept for 9,000 years. Clement of Alexandria was under the impression that the Egyptians had 42 sacred writings of Hermes, writings that detailed the training of Egyptian priests. Siegfried Morins has suggested in Egyptian religion the reference to Thoth's authorship is based on ancient tradition. The figure 42 probably stems from the number of Egyptian gnomes and thus conveys the notion of completeness. The Neoplatonic writers took up Clement's 42 essential texts. Alright, so this hermetic literature, uh, very powerful stuff, man, and stuff that I don't really want to get into, but it says here it's about uh, conjuring spirits and animating statues and also says that it helped rationalize religious cult practices so we're gonna start seeing how Thoth, Hermes and all these things they were doing in Egypt how it led to all these mystery uh, schools they say uh, secret societies which were practicing these religious uh, practices that uh, Hermes and Thoth were teaching right from there we're gonna have a strong correlation to the religions we see today, so it helped help rationalize and systematized religious cult practices, okay? So a little bit more about this uh, hermetic literature, right? It says here, the hermetica is a category of papyri containing spells and initiatory induction procedures. The dialogue called the Aclepius, after the Greek god of healing, describes the art of imprisoning the souls of demons or angels in statues with the help of herbs, gems, and odors, so that the statue could speak and engage in prophecy. In other papyri, there are recipes for con constructing such images and animating them, such as when images are to be fashioned hollow so as to enclose a magic name inscribed on a gold leaf. Okay, you see what, what this is, Hermetica? Are you reading this with me and again etymology online says here Thoth ancient Egyptian god of wisdom and magic hieroglyphics and the reckoning of time from Latin from Greek Thoth from Egyptian Tehudi usually rep represented as a human figure with the head of any beast by the Greeks assimilated to their Hermes okay same person hermetic 1630s dealing with the occult science or alchemy, occult science or alchemy, from Latin Hermeticus, from Greek Hermes, god of science and art, among other things, who was identified by Neoplatonist mystics and alchemists with the Egyptian god 
Doth as Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great Hermes, who supposedly invented the process of making glass tube airtight, a process in alchemy using a secret seal, hence completely sealed. Secret societies, secret proceedings, masons. All right, so we're starting to see that these teachings of Doth and Hermes are starting to become uh, worship. You know, there is. And only by a select few as well, so it's being held a secret, right, in these secret circles. So it says here, worship and cult. Prior to being known as Hermes, Frodenham thought the god to have existed as a snake god. Angelo 1997 thinks Hermes to be based on the Thoth ar archetype. The absorbing combining of the attributes of Hermes to Thoth developed after the time of Homer amongst Greek and Roman Herodotus was the first to identify the Greek god with the Egyptian Hermopolis. Plutarch and Diodorus also, although Plato thought, thought that the gods to be dissimilar. A cult was established in Greece in remote regions, likely making him a god of nature, farmers and shepherds. It is also possible that since the beginning he has been a deity with shaman shamanic attributes linked to divination, reconciliation, magic, sacrifices and initiation and contact with other planes of existence a role of mediator between the worlds of the visible and invisible okay so initiation who does initiations in modern day secret circles now so could these teachings you know possibly be the foundation of our religions of today christianity islam and all the other ones that come out of those two main ones so it says here, many Christian writers, including Lactantius, Augustine, Giordano Bruno, Marsilio Ficino, Campanella, and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, considered Hermes Trigemistus to be a wise pagan prophet who foresaw the coming of Christianity. So <laughs> they call him a wise pagan prophet. He was pagan, but they still call him a prophet. And he was wise. And it says he foresaw the coming of Christianity. How are they relating that to him? Well, we're going to see. They believed in a prisca, theology, theologia. They believed, sorry. They believed in the prisca theologia, the doctrine that a single true theology exists, which threads through all religions. It was given by God to man in antiquity and passed through a series of prophets, which included Zoroaster and Plato. Sorcerer was another uh, Jesus type uh, savior. In order to demonstrate the verity of the Prisca Theologia, Christians appropriated the Hermetic teachings for their own purposes. So, what did the Christians do? <laughs> In order to demonstrate the, ver the verity of the Prisca Theologia, Christians appro appropriated the Hermetic teachings for their own purposes. By this account, Hermes Trismegistus was either a contemporary of Moses or the third in line of men named Hermes, Enoch, Noah, and the Egyptian priest who is known to us as Hermes Trismegistus on account of being the greatest priest, philosopher, and king. So it's very important here as you can see that you know Christianity or they're telling us here they appropriated the Hermetic teachings for their own purposes. So why is he telling us that? We're going to see Islamic tradition. Sayyid Ahmed Amiruddin has pointed out that Hermes Trigemis Trismegistus has a major place in Islamic tradition. He writes, Hermes Trismegistus is mentioned in the Quran in verse 19, 56, 57, mentioned in the book Idris that he was truthful, a prophet. We took him up to a high place. The Jabirian corpus contains the oldest documented source for the Emerald Tablet or Hermes Trismegistus translated by Jabir i Haydn Gerber for the Hash Hashemid Caliph or Baghdad Harun al Rashid, the Abbasid. Alright, so what did it just tell us, man? I mean, listen to what it's telling us here, man. It's telling that Hermes Trismegistus is mentioned in the Quran, okay? And it says that Idris, one of their prophets, and we're going to show you who Idris is <laughs> later on. You're going to see how it links to Hermes and Toph. says that he says that he was truthful, a prophet. 
and we took him up to a high place. So why is the Quran saying Hermes? This occult uh, science, uh, spirit conjuring uh, magician. Why are they call him a prophet? Okay, what do you think all this stuff for genies and the flying the carpets and all that come out of in, in this region of the Middle East? You see, it's Thoth and Hermes teachings. Now let's keep reading. It says Jabir ibn Hayyan a Shite, identified as Jabir al Sufi, was a student of al Jafar al Sadiq, Hussein ibn Ali's great grandson. Thus, for the Abbasids and the Alids, the writings of Hermes Trismegistus were considered sacred, as an inheritance from the Al 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 Bayit. These writings were recorded by the Ink Wan Al Safa, and subsequently translated from Arabic into Persian. Turkish, then Hebrew, Russian, and English. In these writings, Hermes Trimegistus is identified as Idris, okay, Idris, the infallible prophet who traveled to outer space from Egypt and to heaven whence he brought back Adam and the black stone when he landed on earth in India. So, because the ancient earth was all called the three Indias, right? three India so the black stone Kaaba right the Kaaba has the black stone they're talking about in Mecca so again we can see some kind of um, hermetic foundation with um, Christianity and Islam we're gonna go in depth into this with both religions later on again here it goes hermetism also called Hermetism is a religious, philosophical, and esoteric tradition based on primarily upon writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, Trice Great. These writings have greatly influenced the Western esoteric tradition and were considered to be of great importance during both the Renaissance and the Reformation. Okay, you hearing this? Very important. Their tradition claims descent from Prisca Theologia a doctrine that affirms the existence of a single true theology that is present in all religions and that was given by God to man in antiquity. It's present in all religions. Okay, you see what, what I'm trying to tell you here, right? Because we're about to go, we're about to dive in deep. We're about to take it to another level right now, all right? So I hope you're ready, and I'm glad you're still here after an hour. All right, so before we continue, let's just recap a little bit, right? So... We've been able to see that that Thoth, Hermes, Mercury, Hermes, uh, Trismegistus uh, are the same uh, identi identity, deity, uh, person, character, and it doesn't end there. We're gonna see the many manifestations of Thoth, all right, throughout history. It's gonna continue. I'm gonna show you everything else. Again, a recurring theme with these characters or Thoth is writing, alchemy, scribe, record keeper, messenger knowledge underworld god magic science secretary or assistant and that's interesting because we're about to uh, go into the uh, OHP uh, bible if you haven't heard of this book it's a really crazy book but um you know drop nation you know they we take out the baby so we go into these documents you know we don't know if they're real or not but we take out what is necessary you know what we feel is a foundational truth somewhere so we can pull it out right and we can use it and put the pieces together of the puzzle right that we're building now we're gonna start hearing about angels so let's let's read a little bit about an angel here right it says uh, an angel especially according to Abrahamic religions and Zoroastrianism is a spiritual being superior to humans in power and intelligence Angels are typically described as benevolent, dreadful, and endowed with wisdom and knowledge of earthly events, but not infallible, for they strive with each other, and God has to make peace between them. So, angels fight between each other, right? And, and God has to make peace between them, right? Alright, so let's, let's keep going. Most of them serve either as intermediaries between heaven and earth, or as a guardian spirit. So, key word there, intermediaries. They are studied in the theological doctrine of angelology. In Christian science, the word angel is used to refer to an inspiration from God. The use of the term has extended to refer to artistic depictions of the spirits. 
and it is also used figuratively to refer to messengers and to harbingers and to people who possess high qualities of goodness, purity, selflessness, intelligence, or beauty. So you can see all the things that uh, the word angel, the energy, uh, it carries the word uh, angel, right? Angels are referred to in connection with their spiritual missions as, for instance, the angel which, was, ha which has redeemed an interpreter, right? An interpreter. The angel that destroyed, the messenger of the covenant, angel of his presence, and a band of angels of evil. Alright, sounds like Thoth a lot. Let's look at the etymology of the word angel. It says here, the word angel is in English a blend of Old English, angel, with a hard G, and Old French, angeli, both derived from late Latin angelus, messenger, again, messenger, just like Mercury, Thoth, Hermes, which in turn was borrowed from late Greek Angelos. According to uh, RSP Beaks, Angelos itself may be an oriental loan like Persian mounted courier. The word, the word's earliest form is Mycenaean, A.K. Rowe attested in Linear B syllabic script. The Angelos is the default Septuagint's translation of the biblical Hebrew term Malak, denoting simply messenger without specifying its nature. In the Latin Vulgate, the meaning becomes bifurcated when Malak or Angelus is supposed to denote a human messenger. Words like Nintuus or Legatus are applied. If the word refers to some supernatural being, the word Angelus appears. Such differentiation has been taken over by later vernacular translations of the Bible, early Christian and Jewish exegetes, and eventually modern scholars. Again, just a reminder, Hermes, right? Thoth, right? Hermes was the emissary and messenger of the gods. Hermes was also a divine trickster. So Hermes was a messenger and a trickster. Mercury. It says here, like Hermes, he was also a god of messages, eloquence, and of trade, particularly of the grain trade. So Mercury also is known as a messenger or the god of messages. Let's continue. And Thoth says here, it is also considered that Thoth was the scribe of the gods, rather than a messenger. Ampu or Her Hermanubis, there you go again, Hermanubis, was viewed as the messenger of the gods, as he traveled in and out of the underworld and presented himself to the gods and to the humans. So, there's a strong correlation also with this Ampu, or the dog-headed uh, god uh, of Egypt, Anubis, Her Hermanubis, uh, with Thoth. You know, if if we were to correlate Anubis and all the other pe uh, gods that Thoth was, I mean, this video wouldn't end. So, as you can see, Thoth was also like a messenger. He was uh, back and forth, just like an angel can be back and forth, an intermediary. We read that already. So, God, God, uh, Thoth was also one uh, as well. It says here, examples of supernatural messengers are the Malak Jaweh who is either a messenger from God, an aspect of God such as the Logos, or God himself as the messenger, the Theophanic Angel. Archangel Gabriel, also identified as Abruel, Jibril, Jiburili, Serafili. Gabriel means God is my strength. Gabriel told Elizabeth and Mary of the coming births of John the Baptist and Jesus. Gabriel is known as the messenger. She guides hopeful parents through conception and adoption process. She also helps people involved in arts and communication. It says here, additionally, Gabriel is the patron saint of messengers. Hmm. Those who work for broadcasting and telecommunications such as radio and television, remote sensing, postal workers, clerics, diplomats, and stamp collectors. All right, so Gabriel. All right, so we're about to go into this OHP Bible. And uh, I think you guys are ready for it now. You know, we're going to start talking about Gabriel and Doth. So it took me an hour to get to this part of the video. But I think it was uh, worth it. I had to establish uh, certain things with you regarding Doth, the history, and all that's coming out of uh, what we're learning from Doth. All right, so just a reminder, you know, we're just surfing the wave. We're just going to get the babies out of here, right? So it says... The Oaspi, a new Bible, in the words of Jehovah, 
and his angel ambassadors, a sacred history of the dominions of the higher and lower heavens on the earth for the past 24,000 years, together with the synopsis, synopsis of the cosm cosmogony of the universe, the creation of planets, the creation of man, the unseen worlds, the labor and glory of God and gods and goddesses in the ethereal heavens, with the new commandments of Jehovah to man of the present day, with revelations from the second resurrection formed in words in the 33rd year of the Cosman era. All right, so this is the book. Let's get into it. So I'm just going to want to show you the glossary uh, in this book, some of these words very interesting I wanted to see so you can kind of get the idea of where this book takes you so um, the very first word here I, it says Algonquin right the United States of the North American Indians before the destruction of the Christians by the Christians so is that what they called themselves instead of America was it actually called a Algonquin Algonquin tribes were numerous and, and covered a lot of the land in the United States so let's continue Archangel, angels next in rank to gods, who dwell in certain arcs in Etheria. They generally come in the dawn of a cycle to give new inspiration to mortals. So they give inspiration to mortals, okay, intermediaries, right, messengers. While they remain with mortals, as during the last few years, good mortals become more angelic toward one another, okay. So it says here, Babel, confounded by compounding too many things together as the Jihaic language, Babel, confused the languages, beast, the animal man, the earthly part of man, anything that is enforced as a religion, anything that is enforced as a religion, not, not something that is natural, that you're born with, Hawa, Belial, or Belial, or Baal, one of the seven Hebrew tetracts, hypocrisy, crawling, see Satan. And then down here says Bra or Brahman, wisdom, knowledge. Bra was the founder of the Brahmanism and was contemporaneous with Abraham, mean, means that he lived in the same time, or Abraham. See first book of God. And under the false god Enochisa, Enochisa, the word Brahma became synonymous with warrior. Continuing with the glossary, says here uh, in the top Buddha, wisdom, knowledge, but afterward, under the false god Kabalaktis, the word Buddha became synonymous with warrior Kalabaktis. And after that, Christ or Christe, wisdom, knowledge, education. After the false god Loamon falsely took this name, it became synonymous with warrior. So it was hijacked. Christians or Christians, a brotherhood of warriors. They were named Christians in the derision, in derision by the Hebrews. One who rushes into multitude of rioters and with a sword enforces peace is a true Christian. You hearing this? A people whose faith is in arms and stand in armies. Okay? The following words are synonymous. Brahma, Buddha, Christ, Christe, Baal, Ashtaroth, Dagon, Vishnu. Ashdod, knowledge, wisdom, Krishna, light, Po, Tein, Wa, Manido, and in fact, a score of, of others. All right, so you see everything that's related and synonymous with Christian or Christ, Christe, which was hijacked by Luamon. We're going to read about Luamon. Okay, remember that Christian, he was the one who hijacked and enforced Christe. In the bottom it says Div or Diva or Divinity, a parliament of lords in the lower heavens. The Divan laws were in use 3,000 years ago. So Diva, a parliament of lords. So calling all these artists Divas, right? Let's continue. And it says here Ham, Ham on the top. Cosmological name of Egypt, right? Where did Tov go when he left Atlantis? He went to the sons of Cam in Egypt. Cam. Cam means Egypt, chem, uh, the word for chemistry, alchemy, and ham, right? Cosmological name of Egypt, the followers of Abraham bestowed that country's name on him after they settled there, one who was black with sunburn. Okay, continue. Lord, right? So, Diva is a, right? Lord, a god of the earth, or a part of the earth, a god of the earth. You hear this? Not of heaven, a god of the earth 
or part of the earth, next lower in rank than the God of heaven and earth. So it's a rank, right? It's a title. The first exalted rank an angel receives in heaven is Asaf. The second is Ashar. The third is Luis. The fourth, Marshal. And the fifth, Lord. And the sixth, God. So these these words are just titles. Not doesn't mean Hawa, the creator, the breath of life. It says, Marshals are rather vice lords and are not titled. The first title is Lord. The second, God. God sometimes appoints a Lord to a single city on earth, sometimes one to a nation. A Lord's minor dominion is 100 million angels in a major, several thousand millions. Lords must have passed beyond the second resurrection before eligibility. You hear all this crazy stuff? All right, so Thoth was a Lord, right? Most likely. So it says Osiris, Osiris. And we're going to, uh, I'm starting to link Thoth to all these ancient Egyptian gods. Somehow um, they just gave him different names for the different roles he played, but it's the same person. So Osiris says here, philosophy of measurement. Thoth is also known as measurement, right? One who maintains that only what can be measured or weighed is real knowledge. All right, so he doesn't believe in Hawa, the spirit, right? Or the essence, the energy, the vibration of creation, because he can't see it. The sun is the largest, therefore the sun is the almightiest. So that's where sun worship comes out of, because they can see it. Also a god. See Book of Osiris. There was also a false god Osiris of later date who inspired the building of the pyramids. A false god Osiris who built the pyramids, according to Edgar Cayce, was Thoth. And we're telling you that the 18th dynasty, from the 16th to the 18th, is when they started it over there in Egypt. The three pyramids got built it's during the same uh, reign as Dejehuti and Tutmosis. So, let's continue. Alright, so we're going to start from this part of the book. All right, and the very first word you see here is Thoth, right? <laughs> Our main character, right? So let's let's read what it says. Thoth sent the following message to Luamon, to wit, greeting to thee, thou most high triune, in the name of the Holy Ghost. So he's calling Luamon a triune. Triune, if you Google it, uh, you'll see that it represents the tri triety, triety uh, deities or the gods, the triple. Uh, character, triple head, triple face, and you can Google that. So let's continue. And and Thoth continues, where I, wherein I am embarrassed, I pray thee give me leniency. My suit is not without due deliberation and through prayer to the Holy Ghost. Long have I fought thy battles, and I have gained great power and authority in many kingdoms, in heaven and earth. So he says, yo, I've been doing your work for a long time, right? That's what Thoth is telling him. Fought your battles and gain great power and authority. So now he has power and authority, right? Because he was in Egypt, right? In heaven and earth, right? But behold, I labor against gods who have the advantage of me. So he's saying there's other gods that have advantage over him, that he's working against them. The Chinayang rebel gods and the Vindu rebel gods. So the Asian gods and Indian gods or the Vindu, right? Vindia, India, Vindu. Right, the Hindu gods, is he, that's what he's talking about. So there's other gods, right? That fled from the Triune kingdoms in the east. The Triune kingdoms, again, Triune. Have taken upon themselves names popular with the mortals. So, Thoth uh, explains, witness these names. And he says, these are the names. Nestor, alias Puith, Neptune, alias Poseidon, Oleus. Alias Pendre Priam, alias Hoga. So it keeps going with all these names. We'll, we're going to see Kronos here. We're going to see Testor, Suko, Bayrif, Kalchas, uh, Argos, Venus. We're going to see Vishnu, Mira, Thor, Theo, Polkan, uh, alias Agriel, Kalinesa, Hecla, Ja. <laughs> there you go, Ja. Tyronia, Nilkus, Nemertis, Itra, Promethea, Mitra. Ospendis, Miletus, Brahma, Morotota, and these are just some names I'm, I'm reciting here. Hecla, again, Thor, Padua, Hermes, alias Belus, Hyros, Josamis, and the list goes on, right? So, Toph continues, and yet there are none, there are, 
and Toph continued, and yet they are not all, for these gods have no fear of the Holy Ghost, and they choose any name that will be flattering to mortals, and the magicians and priests and such others as have power to hear the voices of spirits are led to believe that they hear the very gods whose names are given. Toph continues, This then is my misfortune, thou most holy god of Triune, I am commanded to give but one name, even the Holy Ghost or the Father, to mortals. So he's saying that they're asking him for a name to worship, because it seems there's a lot of names going around, right? A lot of gods, uh, falsific, uh, well, a lot of gods impersonating the names of of these deities that they had created, the Triunes, right? Or whether my angel hosts speak to the oracles or to persons capable of hearing spirits and say to them. Fight ye for the Holy Ghost, or fight ye for the creative element, Mort mortals he does not. Or they irreverently mock us, saying, What care we for God that is but a ghost, a shadow, a creative element? Give us gods that talk, and of themselves. We want no angels from the Holy Ghost. Bring your gods, and let the oracles tell us what they say. So you hear what he's saying, he's saying the humans are demanding a God that they can see, not somebody that's just in spirit or, or just like a representation. And he's, they saying, we want no angels. They're telling Toph, we want no, none of you guys, none of you messengers, none of you uh, intermediaries. Okay, let's continue. Luimon then sent messengers and suitable escort to Jerusalem on the earth where Toph was stationed at the time. So where was Toph? In Jerusalem. That's what it says here, right? with an angel host of warriors, commanding his presence before his holy council in Habsendi, Luman's heavenly city and kingdom. Okay, Now, after Toph went thither, and they held a council of many days, a disturbance arose in the council in consequence of the heat of the debates. For the gods of the council, for the most part, said, What better are we than the Jehovians? What greater power have we than the Jehovians? Who can answer the philosophy of Thoth, right? Is it a truth? Mortals have never been satisfied with an angel from the gods. They want the god himself. Was not this forever the weakness of the Jehovians? Such angels could give no name that mortals knew, save they falsely assumed a name. Hence their weak weakness compared to such angels as unscrupulously assumed to be gods. Alright, so let me try to break this down. So it seems that Luaman is in this uh, uh, holy council he has in this heavenly kingdom with other gods, right? Or other falling angels. And they're saying, what better are we than the Jehovians? What greater power have we than the Jehovians? So they're saying, you know, they're like, you know, aren't we more stronger than them? They're trying to like, they're almost kind of like creating a confederacy, right? They're, they're, planning something they're creating an agenda here so let's continue behold it has now come to pass mortals desire a more definite god one known unto them we cannot truthfully take the name of any god Toph hath named nor of any other god worshipped by mortals so look what it's saying it's saying that they can't uh, worship anymore the gods that Thoth has named. So how many representations does Thoth have? I told you he's met a lot of gods. All right? Let's continue. Luimon then drove hence from the palace his holy council, that he might have an opportunity to reason with himself as to what to do. So it says that he went into his holy council, right? Uh, so he can like think about what he needs to do what is what is he going to do man they're requiring a name a god right that's what Thoth is saying so let's see what he what happens so Luman goes to the holy council right so it says here Sain enters the holy council on Hapsendi and speaks unto Luman the triune okay so let's, let's see what goes on in the holy council hear me O thou most upright of God mine is a tale of pity and of horrors for thy people Behold, thy one-time brother, Triunes, have had great advantages of thee from the start. They had more populous kingdoms and subjects of higher grades. Nevertheless, wherein they have prospered, thou shalt be wise. They also found it necessary to have a name that mortals could call on to, and they took upon themselves the name Brahma and Buddha, both of which signify knowledge no more 
ignore no less. So it's saying that it seems that there's other gods established and that they actually were able to establish their names with these people. So um, Satan, I guess, hasn't been worshipped as much as he would like to. That's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm interpreting here. That there's other gods that they actually went by Brahma and Buddha, right? The Vindu we read earlier, and the Chinan, the Asian gods, and the Vindi and the Indian gods, right? So let's continue. This has satisfied mortals. Now thou shalt choose the name Christe, which is the Ahamic word for knowledge, also. And this then thou shalt have truth on thy side in heaven before the holy council. And on earth thou shalt have a personal embodiment. So he told Luaman, uh, uh, Satan, to go ahead and use the name Christe. And that he will be backed up by the holy council in heaven. So to, he gave him his blessings, right? And on earth thou shalt have a per personal embodiment. Okay, so he should have a personal embodiment on earth. Alright, so here we go. Let's continue. So we continue, right? So it says here, Luimon falsely announces himself the Christ, right? Because he just got the uh, okay from Satan himself to use this name according to this Bible, this book, right? So let's continue. It says, The Lord said, Behold, it came to pass, as had been foretold by God, Jehovah's Son, the triunes will all become false gods. They became false gods. So they weren't always false gods. Because they have denied the Almighty. So they chose this order, not the order that was already established from the beginning. And God said, there is but one who is all knowledge. Whatsoever angel or God announces himself to be all knowledge is false in presence of Jehovah. So he's saying there's only one true creator. Whatever angel, messenger, right, God, because these are titles, right? God, because they call themselves gods in people's name, but the word God is a man word. It's so created by man, right? The creator is Hawa. It's vibration. It's the breath of life. Hilva. To be, to exist. So it says, Whatsoever angel of God announces himself to be all knowledge is false in presence of Jehovah's. Nevertheless, Luimon had it proclaimed in heaven and earth that he was the Christe which is the Yahamic expression for all knowledge. So again, Brahma, Buddha, and Krista just meant knowledge. They basically made that a name and made it into a god, a deity to worship. That's what it's saying here. The Lord said, Now therefore Luman was from this time forth a false god in the heaven on earth. So from that time on he was considered a false god when he actually said, No, I am the Christe. All right, He proclaimed himself a god. And Luimon commanded Thoth, who? Thoth, our favorite person in the story, right? Our main character, Thoth, his angel, he's an angel, warrior, right? He's being described as an angel, warrior, in command of his earthly dominions to raise up tribes of warriors amongst mortals. And by the inspiration of said Thoth, these warriors were induced to call themselves Christians, or in parentheses, Christians, all right? Are you following what's going on? All right, so let's continue because we're about to get really deep with this. All right, how much of a fairy tale is this? All right, so let's continue. So Toph called them the Christians, right? <laughs> so let's see if we remember now. Again, it says here in Wikipedia, many writers including, you know, all these they have right here, among them Giordano, Bruno, Augustine, uh, Sir Thomas Brown, Ralph Walter Emerson. It says, considered Hermes, Trige, Trismegistus to be a wise pagan prophet who foresaw the coming of Christianity. Hermes is Thoth. Thoth is the one they sent to start the Christian the Christ faith or the Christian God, the Christians. It says Hermes was a wise pagan prophet who foresaw the coming of Christianity to these early Christians. Let's continue. Again, Hermetism is a religious philosophical an esoteric tradition based primarily upon writings and attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, Trias Great. It says these writings have greatly influenced the Western esoteric tradition and were considered to be of great importance during both Renaissance and the Reformation. Okay? 
Let's continue. The tradition claims descent from Priscatiologia, a doctrine that affirms the existence of a single true theology that is present in all religions. That was present in all religions and that was given by God to man in antiquity. Okay, in antiquity, way back. Now we don't know if the OHP is true or not, if it was really from an angel or a good angel or a bad angel, but we see that Thoth was sent to go ahead and, and proclaim the Christian name and, and create the Christians, right? And we see how Thoth was Hermes, and we see how Hermes created Hermetism, and we see how Hermetism had a, a lot of influence in creating our religions. Especially in those times, those secret mystery schools, those secret societies that were being established in Greece and Egypt. We know that uh, Thoth and the Emerald Tablet said he went over to Egypt, right? Where the Barbary hairy ones lived, right? To Cam, the sons of Cam, right? And um, if you are a scholar of religion or history or theology, you know that a lot of uh, influence has come out of Egypt for these three uh, religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. So am I the only one relating this? Of course not. All right, let's continue. So can we discern? So let's continue. It says regarding Hermetism, it says here, in late antiquity, Hermetism emerged in parallel with early Christianity. You hear this? Parallel with early Christianity. Who told Toph to go down and create the Christians or, or have the people called the God Christe? Right? So in late antiquity, Hermetism emerged in parallel with early Christianity, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, the Chaldean oracles, and the late Orphic and Pythagorean literature. These doctrines were characterized by resistance to the dominance of either pure rationality or doctrinal faith. The books now known as the Corpus Hermeticum were part of the renaissance of syncretistic and intellectualized pagan thought that took place from the 3rd to the 7th century AD. You, you see how long that book was in, uh, going around and how it was used by, you know, it was very popular in pagan thought. These post-Christian Greek texts dwell upon the oneness and goodness of God, urge purification of the soul, and defend pagan religious practices such as the veneration of images. Okay, what are we starting to get into here, right? Let's pay attention because this is going to lead us to a lot of things. So it says, it urged purification of the soul and defend pagan religious practices such as the veneration of images. So again, commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. All right, let's go back. So again, it continues here uh, and defend pagan religious practices such as the veneration of images their predominant literary form is the dialogue Hermes Trismegistus instructs a perplexed disciple upon various teachings of the hidden wisdom so who wrote this her hermetic uh, writing hermetism he created hermetism right it's Hermes aka Thoth all right, Luman sent Thoth and told him, go tell them to worship Christe, give them the name Christe. And out of that came the Christians, right, the warriors. All right, so what are we seeing here? Hermetism, Thoth's writings was very popular. And it defended the right to practice and ve venerate images, veneration of images. All right, so early Christians again said that Hermes Trigamestus was a wise pagan prophet that foresaw the coming of Christianity. All right, so let's continue. There, it says here, in modern era, in 1945, hermetic texts were found near the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi. So these are real. You see, they were found. One of these texts had the form of a conversation between Hermes and Asclepius. So Hermes ain't fiction. All right. A second text titled On the Ogdot and Enya told of the Hermetic Mystery Schools. Alright, so this is what I was talking about, the mystery schools and these secret societies they started establishing with this knowledge that Toph, Hermes, was teaching. It was written in the Coptic language. 
the latest and final form in which the Egyptian language was written. And it says here, according to Giza Vermes, Hermetism was a Hellenistic mysticism contemporaneous with the fourth gospel. You hear this? Okay. And Hermes, Tre Tresmegistus, was the Hellenized reincarnation of the Egyptian deity Thoth, the source of wisdom who was believed to defy man through knowledge, or as they say here, Gnosis, Gnosticism. So look how he, what he influenced as well. And Gilles Quiskell says, it is not completely certain that there existed before and after the beginning of Christian era in Alexandria a secret society akin to a Masonic lodge. The members of this group were called themselves brethren, were initiated through a baptism of the spirit, initiate, and it continues, greeted each other with a sacred kiss, celebrated a sacred meal, and read the hermetic writings as edifying treatises for the spiritual progress. Alright, so is this a joke, you see? Is this the start of the early Christians that Thoth went down to uh, establish when Luamon sent him? Because they needed, the people were asking for a name of a god. They were following the other gods because the other gods had names. Alright, so let's con And it says here, the cross marked Hermes, a god of four-way crossroads, the four quarters of the earth, the four elements, the four divisions of the sacred year, the four winds, and the solstices and equinoxes represented by their zodiacal totems, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, the bull, lion, serpent, and man-angel, symbols adopted by the Christians to represent the four evangelists. Okay, look what it was adopted by the Christians. Okay. Sometimes the cross of Hermes was an unk standing on a crescent that signified his mother, the moon. Remember, he was considered the moon as well before he was considered um, Thoth, the deity of record keeping and all that, and wisdom. He was considered the god of the moon. So he's right here saying his mom is the moon. So it's almost the same thing. This evolved into the conventional sign of Mercury. A circle with a cross sign of Mercury Hermes below and a crescent above all right you see the symbol here of the Ankh uh, or the cross here right and we're gonna start seeing uh, these horns or this crescent moon everywhere and if, I know you've seen it everywhere too so that's where it comes from and the bull we're gonna start seeing the bull but it's gonna be related you know to to off or, or you know one of the falling angels having people worship the bull the image of the bull and again we see the bird right we see that there's a bird always related with Thoth right or Hermes Thoth the bird all right so let's continue so we know that when we're talking about Hermes we're just talking about Thoth right he was like the Abyss right and it says that he was the lord of Kemenu the later city of Hermopolis we're going to see what Hermopolis was for him and what it was for the ancient world, which was his major cult center. Hermopolis was so named because of the Greek association of Thoth with the god Hermes to the Greek. Thoth became Hermes three Megistus. Thoth, the thrice great, often given as three times great. All right, so Hermopolis, right? His main cult was in Hermopolis. Hermopolis. Egyptian for Kemenu was a major city in antiquity located near the boundary between Lower and Upper Egypt, a provincial capital since the Old Kingdom period. So it's really old. Hermopolis developed into a major city of Roman Egypt and an early Christian center from the 3rd century. An early Christian center. Are we relating Hermopolis and Hermes and Thoth to the Christians? And the Christian an early Christian center. This is Wikipedia, not me, people. It, it continues. It says here, a Christian tradition holds it to be the place where the Holy Family found refuge during its, its exile in Egypt. Hermopolis Mayor was a suffragan diocese of the provincial capital's metropolitan archdiocese of Antino in the sway of the Patriarch of Alexandria. 
like most it faded under Islam so you see this was a, a big uh, Christian center and this is where the Holy Family went during their exile in Egypt if you know the story do you remember as a child I believe Herod was gonna kill him so they had to flee to Egypt and this is where they went Hermopolis where the major uh, cult temple for Thoth, Hermes and Typhoon is where all this started where Thoth landed and set up shop and who is the holy family you know who's the holy family all right so there's a major uh, Christian center here in Hermopolis the holy family is going there and we're starting to see that they are worshiping you know these these teachings these secret societies these, these he Hellenistic mystery schools as they call them right and it says here um, a cult was established in Greece in remote regions likely making him a god of nature so they're talking about Hermes and shepherds okay shepherds remember that word it is also possible that since the beginning he has been a deity with shamanic attributes linked to divination reconciliation magic sacrifices okay sacrifices and initiation there you go initiation secret societies in contact with other planes of existence other planes of existence a role of a mediator between the between the worlds of the visible and invisible so we can say you know the teachings of Thoth and Hermes had a lot of influence back in these days and it was starting to be worshipped as, as a god as a, as, a, as a religion almost so it's who were they worshipping well the emissary and messenger of the gods Hermes this divine trickster as it says here in the middle Hermes was also a divine trickster all right why was he a trickster why are they calling him that is he is he doing things that he shouldn't be doing and again it says here epithets of Hermes right and it shows all these different uh, names Atlantiades Cryophoros Argefontis first of all what is an epithet in etymology online it says epithet descriptive name for a person or a thing it's just a descriptive name for a person or a, or a thing so if they say epithet of Hermes it's just giving him a descriptive name let's continue from Middle French epitete or directly from Latin epitetum uh, Spanish epiteto Portuguese epiteto from the Gr Greek epiteton an epithet something added a noun used as an adjective attributed added assumed so it's assumed to be Hermes right the same from it epitetenai to add on from epi in addition so it is Hermes the same just added something added to it uh, see epi titanio to put to place from a re, re, from a reduplicated form of pie root je de to set put all right that's what epithet means so it just means the same a descriptive name for a person or thing so a descriptive name for Hermes would be Cryophotos Cryophotos right Cryophotos very important so it says in ancient Greek cult Cryophotos or Cryophotos Cryophorus, the ram bearer, is a figure that commemorates the solemn sacrifice of a ram. It becomes an epithet of Hermes, Hermes Cryophorus. So Cryophorus, the ram bearer, right? So we read earlier that Hermes is worshipped as nature, as a farmer, and as a shepherd. So we have this right here. If you can see, it says Cryophoroi, the good shepherd. It says freestanding 4th century Roman sculpture and even 3rd century ones are sometimes identified as Christ, the Good Shepherd. So it's not the same. It says sometimes identified as Christ, the Good Shepherd. Illustrating the pericope in the Gospel of John and also the 2nd century Christian liter literary work, The Shepherd of Hermes. I'm going to read that soon. In two-dimensional art, Hermes creates photos transformed into the Christ carrying a lamb walking among his sheep. Okay, are you hearing this? Hermes Cross photos transformed into Christ carrying a lamb walking amongst his sheep. And here we go again with Thoth influencing, right? Thoth Hermes. It says, Thus we find philosophers holding scrolls or a Hermes Cross photos which can be turned into Christ giving the law, traditio, legis and the Good Shepherd respectively. 
Peter Linda Murray, the Oxford Companion to Classical Art and Architecture, page 475. The Good Shepherd is a common motive from the catacombs of Rome, Gardner, 10, figure 54, and in sarcophagus rel reliefs, where Christian and pagan symbolism are often combined. Christian and pagan symbolism are often combined, making secure identification difficult. The theme does appear in the wall paintings of the baptistry of the Dura Erophoros Church, a house church of Dura Erophoros before 256 C. So this is uh, the image that uh, is there that they say in this church, right? You can see that it's like a, a figure of a man holding a, a ram around his shoulder. This is a very old image, and I'm going to show you what what you know how old this church is and what was the significance of this church. They got Creos photos in it, right? supposed to be an early Christian church and they have Creos photos uh, image in it and it says here regarding the Dura Europos church in Wikipedia it's the earliest identified Christian house church okay the earliest church Christian church it is located in Dura Europos in Syria it is one of the earliest known Christian churches and was apparently a normal domestic house converted for worship sometime between 233 and 256 when the town was abandoned after the conquest of the Persians it is less famous smaller and more modestly decorated than the nearby Dura Yerofos synagogue though there are many other similarities between them all right so this early church has an image a pagan image of Creos photos so you see how even in the earliest foundations of Christianity, there's evidence of uh, pagan worship. So let's continue. And this is another uh, image or a painting that's well in the wall in this church. As you can see, there's some heavy sun symbolism here. I'm not sure if they worship it, but it's a church. They have all these symbolisms there. They have Chris photos, so most likely they are worshiping the sun, right? And also, in this place, we can find. A depiction of our copper colored Hebrews on the other side of the world, right? This is the Exodus, a depiction of the crossing, the parting of the sea. Take a look, copper colored. I'll just leave it at that. Continuing where we were with the Good Shepherd now. So it says this fresco of the Good Shepherd was found on the ceiling of the vault of Lu Lucina in the catacomb of Calixtus in Rome. The construction of the vault itself has been dated to the second half of the second century, but the use of the red and green lines to divide the space, similar to the chambers under San Sebastiano, has suggested the first half of the middle of the third century for this fresco, okay, so even later. The image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd was an especially popular motif in the early Christian centuries. It was based in several biblical passages including the 23rd Psalm and Saints of Jesus and is also an adaptation of popular pagan pagan image an adaptation of a popular pagan pagan image so we're talking about the Good Shepherd right we're just talking about Thoth again right Thoth Hermes it says here the Shepherd of Hermas the Shepherd of Hermas is a Christian literary work of the late 1st and mid 2nd century considered a valuable book by many Christians okay and considered canonical scripture canonical scripture by some of the early church fathers such as Irenaeus so it was considered canonical the shepherd of Hermes right okay the shepherd was very popular amongst Christians in the 2nd and 3rd centuries it was bound as part of the New Testament in the codex Sina Sinaiticus and it was listed between the Acts of the Apostles and the Acts of Paul in the uh, stichometrical list of the Codex Claromontanus. You hearing all this, people? The work comprises five visions, twelve mandates, and ten parables. It relies on allegory and pays special attention to the Church, calling the faithful to repent to the sins that have harmed it. The book was originally written in Rome, in the Greek language. But at first, Latin translations, the Bulgata, was made very shortly afterwards. A second Latin translation, the Palatina, was made at the beginning of the 5th century. Of the Greek version, the last fifth or so is missing. 
okay and it continues the shepherd is one of the meanings that was probably attached to some figurines of the good shepherd as well as a symbol for Christ or a traditional pagan cross photo so they're not the same it was just adapted and it made a symbol for Christ traditional pagan cross photos all right we're gonna keep linking more things are you still with me people let's continue we're almost done with this first all right so listen to this part so this is the shepherd of Hermes is again an early Christian writing which contains teachings also for the Christians of today Hermes was vouched saved a series of visions of the church who appeared in the form of a lady a lady is this the Virgin Mary apparitions we know of today instructing him on the nature of the church and on the moral obligations of all Christians okay and finally we see the uh, correlation with uh, the Good Shepherd which it says here is an image used in the pericope of John 10 1 21 in which Jesus Christ is depicted as the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep similarly just cheap. Similar imagery is used in Psalms 23. The Good Shepherd is also discussed in the other Gospels, the Epistle to the Hebrews, the first Epistle of Peter, and Book of Revelations, in reference to Jesus not letting himself lose any of his sheep. Okay. All right. So look at the statue. Look at the image. That is Chrysostom again. Hermetic teachings made it okay for pagans right to keep worshiping their images right and Christianity adopted these images so all right all right so an hour and 40 minutes all right so this is a good time to stop uh, part one there's tons of information left we're still gonna keep continuing to connect uh, Thoth with the influence of Christianity and Islam uh, you don't want to miss the next video just wanted to recap what we've learned so far I'm just direct digging through all these uh, documents and uh, uh, sources because we're looking for foundational truths right we got to get the babies out we got to connect the pieces together and see the, the the bigger picture the puzzle right we got to put the puzzle together right it's time it's time so we know that um this uh, ancient deity right off has infiltrated many aspects of the ancient world as a god as a messenger, as an angel, as uh, the representation of knowledge, wisdom, magic, science, and alchemy. He was influential in establishing Egypt or Chem, Chemnu, where he has his uh, main cult uh, temple to worship him and Typhoon. That is Chemnu, and it's called Hermopolis after Hermes was also tough right and we see that we're starting to see that all these mystery schools that were established by this Hellenistic uh, teachings that Toph was um, providing and giving to the humans uh, influenced very much so the early stages of Christianity we haven't got into Islam yet but we're gonna start seeing that too so in the next video we are gonna uh, continue we're gonna talk about Serapis right and Apis we're gonna talk about all different uh, Christian or Catholic uh, holidays or religious days Christmas <laughs> Easter you know we're gonna get into Isis Toffs wife or daughter seems to be tough as well just a different aspect or epithet as we learned a, de a de descriptive name for Toph or Hermes the hermetic teachings how they influence the Islam and if you know you know I mean remember the Emerald Tablet was first translated or found in Aram Arabic okay so there's a big uh, so Islam plays a large role with this and if we know what's going on today, we see the Christians and Muslims are fighting. They've been fighting since day one, and we know now. We know it's because of um, 
what Thoth and the Luamon and the other gods, the other fallen angels did. They were creating their own religions and providing names to the humans so they can worship them. You know, these, these false gods. All right, so we're going to get back into the Yoashpi. It's going to get very, very interesting. You're going to see how Luamon and Thoth look for a king on earth to help them with this Christian religion they're trying to, or Christe, or the Christians, right? Because they're losing battles and stuff. So you're going to read how they went and chose Constantine. Yes, Constantine, who legalized and established the Roman Catholic religion in the Council of Nicaea. We're going to talk about all this. We're going to go into the name of Jesus, what it means, or oh, Iesus, right? Iesus, the symbology the vibration it carries where it doesn't come from all right and we're gonna also get into Jeshua right because I do know Jeshua did exist and it's recorded in the Old Testament but I Jesus is not him apart from these religions that we know we're also gonna see as well as the different forms that Thoth took right we starting to see a, a, a pattern of this bird figure right and it's not only in Egypt, it's not only on that side, all right? So we have it on this side of the earth in Americas. I'm going to show that to you too in the next video. You know, we're going to see how he really influenced a lot of things in this ancient world. Hope you guys enjoyed this first part. And hope you, to see you in the next video, all right? So if you made it this far... You don't want to stay right here. We've got a lot more coming. All right, so blessings. Thanks for being here.